Enjoy. 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 Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, have a massive round of applause, please, for Matt Welcome's talk. A brief issue of Linus Hess. Thank you, I hope you enjoyed that. <laughs> really did seem like nothing happened, didn't it? Okay, <laughs> that's my proof. <laughs> right, welcome. Uh, I feel as if I know you all, it's so odd, it's unusual, but it's a great crowd. Uh, this is my talk, A Brief History of Timelessness. Um, anyone who knows me will know that I, I either talk about time or I tend to talk about nothing much at all, but it's mainly time, and you've all sat in the pub with me and been bored senseless with me going on about it. So now, by watching this talk, you will have paid your dues and you can legitimately say, Matt, I've seen the show. <laughs> talk to someone else about it. A uh, Brief History of Timelessness is about why it's always now everywhere. And in the first half, it's going to be two halves, I'm going to try and make them about 50 minutes long. There's a lot of slides, but they're quite light and we can power through them quite well. Um, first half, I'm going to look at why we think time exists, why I think I can disprove the existence of time. Look at the past, present and the future, then have a break, get some drinks, refreshments. Second half, putting the past, present and the future all together into one thing. Look at ageing, if there's no such thing as time, how come we age? Look at the temporal order of events, if there's no such thing as time. How can there not be? There must be an order to events. And time travel. Some scientists say you can do it, or it's technically being done. I'll try and disprove that as well. Uh, so this is all about a book that I wrote. Uh, I sat down and wrote it because I realised that if I didn't write it, I would bore all of you senselessly for the next 50 years telling you about this book I was going to write. Too late to cry. Say again? Too late to cry. To, to labour the cry. Too late to cry. Yes, too late to cry. But what I mean is I would spend the next kind of 50 years or whatever saying, and I was going to have a section on this, and I was going to have a section on that. And I realised at some point I've got to write the thing, and then it's out of my system or whatever. Uh, I'm going to put it on Kindle at the very least. Um, this is 500 pages. On Kindle it works out even more, so I've got to cut the whole thing down, but whatever. We'll see. This is a quote by Albert Einstein, for we convince physicists the distinction between the past, present and future is only illusion, however persistent. He wrote that in a letter to the widow of his, uh, his friend, uh, obviously after he died. And this comes from an aspect of, of physics. If you look at a wave crashing against a shore or against a rock, it's very obvious that it's happening forwards. And if you play that video and play it backwards, it would be very obvious that it's happening backwards. But if you're a physicist and you zoom right into atoms and electrons and you look at all the little exchanges that go on, you can never really tell whether they're happening forwards or backwards. They're completely what people would call time reversible. So Albert Einstein suspected this, but he could never quite express it. What's this and what it's all about? How did it start? Well, one day during a very relaxing bath, uh, I suddenly realised that everything that's happening anywhere must be happening now. Uh, if you think about it, every bird that's flying must be doing something. Even if it's on the ground, it'll be doing something. Every fish in the sea will be doing something. Even the dead fish are moving around. The brains are full of stuff. Even if you're not looking at your memory, it's sitting there, whatever, you'll think about stuff. The earth is constantly spinning. The sun is constantly shining. The waves are constantly hitting the shore. Trains sometimes are running. <laughs> So I began thinking and reading about time, and these are all books that are explicitly on time, because I had this idea that I could, I could really explain time, but I had to check it out against all these different books, and of course the top one here is A Brief History of Time, which is very frustrating because it talks about the creation of the universe, but it doesn't actually explain time. It's, uh, I'm suing him at the moment. So those are those books again. These are a very good series of books, uh, introducing books. They've got kind of cartoony pictures in them. And if you ever want to learn anything about this kind of stuff, just get those books and they're great stuff. Uh, you can see I've bought a couple of them twice. I don't know where they are, but it's good. I was a bit annoyed when I Isn't it just that we've all done it? And these are more books uh, that I bought about time. Oh, I wonder where that was. <laughs> so then I wrote my own book after or during reading those books. Should point out at this point that half of my friends think this book is pointless because it's obvious that time exists. And some of you are probably thinking that now. The other half think it's pointless because it's obvious that time does not exist. And I find this very fascinating that two people can be completely opposed in their view and yet still think I shouldn't bother writing the book. <laughs> <laughs> the other half think that my maths isn't good enough to prove the point either way. Let's see. 
which quarter of them is correct. Nonetheless, for your education and entertainment, I shall first trap us all in and then release us all from time. What I should point out is this conversation can sound very complicated, but that's only because I'm untangling something that is being created that is complicated. What I'm explaining is very, very simple. I'll explain it over and over again. There's only about three or four sentences to explain the whole thing. When we look at time, it just is a tangled mess. There's so many wolves and possibilities and paradoxes. And when we look at time, we can see everything is just as it appears to be. So what is time and why do we even think it exists? It's important that we all agree on a kind of definition of time. I've had a lot of these conversations, and if you don't have a definition, it's a bit like arguing whether God exists or not. And by the end of the argument, you find they meant something completely different to you. It's, it's almost like two people arguing about a film, and at the very end they go, I thought you were talking about 101 Dalmatians. No, I was talking about which over the river quiet. Oh, that will explain our misunderstandings. When we look at time, when we ask the questions about time, whenever I have a conversation about time, many, many, many other topics come up and we think about these things. We, we tend to think, uh, in any conversation about time, people say, oh, but do you think God exists? Go, oh, that's not what I'm talking about, I'm talking about time. Ah, oh, but do you think the, the Eastern religions are correct? Do you think aliens exist? How did the universe start? How will the universe end? If a tree falls in the forest, there's no one there to hear it. Will it make a sound? Who shot Kennedy? Who shot JL? Did we go to the moon? What happens when we die? What happens if Hitler had been killed before World War II? What happens if we could predict the lottery numbers? Blah, 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 blah. And all I'm talking about is time. And it's very important that we don't get lost and diverted on all those other tangents that pop up. Because if you do that, the conversation never finishes. And then it's someone else's round, and then we all have to go home. And, and that can give you the impression that time is a very complicated thing, when actually it's not, if you just have an insanely mental-focused attitude and get obsessed about it. But before we can go on and talk about time, of course, we have to clear up uh, that it was Sue Ellen's thing. Because <laughs> 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 otherwise, you'd all be sitting there going, oh, God, that's really, what do you think of that talk? I don't know, at the beginning, there was this... So I didn't actually know that until I looked it up. So what is time? Time is our number one noun. I didn't know that until a couple of weeks ago. Uh, time, year, and day are right up there in the, in the top five nouns. So we talk about time a great deal. However, your first notion of time probably didn't come from you. You probably didn't discover time yourself. You, you discovered things like magnets and, and glue and falling over. But your first notion of time probably came from your parents yelling bedtime and pointing to a clock. And that's important because if you've got this idea of time in your head, but you didn't really come up with it yourself, it's almost like you've got a religion in your head. You know, it always surprises me how many Catholics have Catholic children, and how many Protestants have Protestant children, and how many Jews have Jewish children, and it just seems such a coincidence. <laughs> that, you know, it just seems astonishing, but whatever. But a clock is really just a bunch of springs and cogs. And this is a, I can never pronounce it, shilling clock, <laughs> it sounds very odd. And this is a kit that you can buy, and of course I bought one. Um, and this is the spring, the main spring here. There's a key on the back, you wind it up, it's a little ratchet. It looks very complicated when you don't know what you're looking at. But basically, this cog here drives a little black cog at the back there, and that will turn the minute hand very quickly. The black, black cog then drives this green one out to here, and then the green one drives this pink one back into here. So it'll turn the hour hand a lot more slowly. That's one simple part of the clock, just these bits here. And this is another chain of cogs which uh, interact with the pendulum. And what I did is I took the thing apart, obviously. <laughs> you, know, so, I mean, you have to make it as a kit, so whatever. That's the spring, that's driving those cogs there. This is the interesting bit. This spring here, if you just wound it up and let it go, it would just like, unwind at great speed. But what this one does is it drives a blue one, it drives a yellow one, it drives a red one, it drives a white one. The white one's got a little mechanism up here. So it, it can only move on a notch if this pendulum is swinging. And every time the pendulum swings, it allows us to move on a notch. Then this actually gives the pendulum a little kick. So it's using the energy from the spring, uh, but it's only oscillating at a, a steady rate. You put it all back together again, you got a clock. But it's still a load of cogs in just a spring. So what really is time? <coughs> we say time consists of the past, the present, and the future. Time is also said to have a, a flow, um, flows from the future through the infinitely thin present uh, into the past. 
and it's got a one-way direction. We tend to do things in, in a kind of temporal order. Um, you get up, then you brush your teeth, then you have a cup of tea. You don't tend to have a cup of tea, then get up, and then brush your teeth, unless you're married. I don't know how it works. Well. <laughs> We say the past exists because things clearly happen and have clearly happened that are not happening now. Of course, this is England winning the World Cup, which is clearly not happening now. And we can remember things. So this is an aspect of the past. We can sit there, we can remember what we did last week. We can't remember whether it will rain tomorrow or not. So that's the definition of the past. We say the present exists because we can constantly see it. And this, of course, is a number of people constantly seeing the present. Uh, this guy here, I think, is an existentialist who wants to actually get inside the present and really understand it. Uh, maybe that's <coughs> We say the future exists because we know things will happen that aren't happening now. So we don't know what the weather's going to be like. Well, I always think this is a bit of a cop-out. It's kind of cloudy and snowy and rainy, but it could be sunny. Which just seems a bit of a cheat. We don't know if we're going to win the lottery or not, but we do know we're going to die. So sometimes we can predict these things and sometimes we can't, and that seems to be the nature of the future. Say so time has got to flow in a direction because we're born, we live, we die. This is a, a very rare picture of Albert Einstein <laughs> as a baby, <laughs> which I found on the internet. I don't know idea how that was. Is that some category of porn that we don't know about? And of course, how did that get in there? Uh, volleyball, the epitome of living, and that's uh, my first foray into Photoshop. It's quite good fun. And night follows day, <coughs> day follows night. Spring, summer, autumn, and winter all happen in that order. Or to sum it up, um, there's a constantly receding and accumulating past. The past seems to be constantly moving behind us, getting further and further away. It seems to be accumulating. You have more and more memories. There are more and more days in the calendar that's gone by. More and more newspapers piling up, and we can see what happened. There's a clearly visible present in which things keep happening. That's it and a future which seems to constantly arrive but is somewhat unpredictable and somewhat predictable. We might know that the sun will rise at you know, 7.30 or you could pin it down even more accurately than that. But other things are completely unpredictable. And there's a flow, direction and order. Or, to sum it all up, Rome wasn't built in a day. I could have just put that at the beginning, couldn't I? It saved us all a lot of time. But what do the experts think? That's just our general human view of time. I'm sure you've all sat down and analysed it to that degree. But what do the experts really think? This is um, the professor from The Simpsons, and I don't know if you ever saw that episode where they were questioning the possible reality of a so-called third dimension, which, of course, in The Simpsons they don't have, because it's <laughs> So the experts uh, are sure that time really exists. But one thing to, to be wary of as we look at what the experts say about time so I ask this question, do any of them really prove that the past and the future exist? Because these are the cornerstones of time. We can all see the present is here. But this, this idea of the past, it seems so obvious that it exists, but does it? And do these experts prove it? Aristotle, one of the first people um, this time exists. I always remember seeing a cartoon of a couple of Roman soldiers in, in 300 BC, and one of them was saying to the other, how do we know it's 300 BC? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> he wouldn't have known, would he? <coughs> Aristotle, apparently very intelligent guy. Does time exist? Time, it might be said, consists of the past, present and future. But the past has been and is no longer. While the future is about to be and is not yet. And the now, that is the present, is evidently not a part of time. Since no parts of time exist, how can time itself exist? And this is, to me, an example of that knot that I was showing you at the beginning. If you make certain assumptions and you run away with them and you act as if certain things exist and you haven't proved it, it's kind of complicated. Augustine of Hippo, uh, I can't think of any jokes to do with that, unfortunately, and none of the obvious ones, uh, 354, whatever. He said, what, is, what then is time? If no one asks me, I know. If I wish to explain it to one that asketh, I know not. Which is a load of bollocks, isn't it, really? <laughs> you can't just go around saying that, can you? you go, yeah. You know, where are the keys? Ah, oh, if you don't ask me, then I know. But if you ask me, then I don't. You can get out of anything, can you? you go, yeah. Did you kill him? Ah, oh, if you ask me. <laughs> Galileo Galilei, uh, his full name, of course, uh, Figaro Magnifico. Uh, I'm just a poor boy. I can never say that name without saying that. Stephen Hawking. 
says, Galileo, perhaps more than any other single person, was responsible for the birth of modern science. And in my opinion, probably the birth of real time, because he started doing experiments. Uh, the experiments he, he did were involving pendulums. You saw a pendulum <coughs> in the back of that, that clock. And this is a fundamental principle. He was in a, a church, and he was watching the lantern swing. And of course, in the church, a lot of still air, a lot of very boring things going on. And he was watching these pendulums swing, and he noticed that they swang at the same period of time, so to speak. What he really did was he compared the swing of the pendulum to his pulse. And what he discovered was that even as that, that range of swing dampens down and becomes less and less, the pendulum t still takes the same number of pulses to swing from left to right. That's very important because that means with a bit of string about a metre long and a, a weight of any mass, it doesn't matter what the mass is, you can make a fairly accurate clock you know, back in the 1500s. You can improve that clock, you can make a, a longer piece of string, a heavier mass, make sure there aren't any drafts, very useful thing to do, you know, quite a phenomenal achievement. What he did with that was he set up pendulums and he started looking at the motion of objects. If you chuck a ball through the air, it's very hard to see what that ball's doing or to time or to track it, but, and this was his stroke of genius, if you make a, a gently sloped ramp, you can roll that ball over the ramp and it mimics the path of a ball through the air, but it slows it right down. You can even chase the ball with a piece of chalk. So right back then, with, with nothing sophisticated at all, he could do a lot of very important calculations about projectiles. And I mean, you could just throw this ball straight up here and let it roll straight down. And you're looking at what happens when you throw a ball up high or when it falls off a tower. You can increase the, the st steepness of this ramp and you'll get closer and closer to real gravity and so on. But he was really just comparing this to this. And while he's counting the pendulum swings, he'll be counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <clears throat> that gives you the impression that there might be some other thing that's constantly progressing forwards in an unknown direction that doesn't really matter, and it goes on endlessly. And I think this is, is critical, because this is the real beginning of, of the idea that there's this extra dimension or, or direction that you can go in. What he actually did was he used water clocks more than pendulums. He had a, a bucket with a small hole, he put his finger over the hole, let water flow out while he was timing something and then weigh the water that came out. But nonetheless, what he could have done, instead of counting the swings of a pendulum, is he could have just got a ball on a ramp and numbered the ramp at certain distances. And he could have used that as his clock. And he could have counted this, one, two, three, four, as it's passing these marks. And that would have exposed the fact that he was just comparing the motion of one thing to another thing. Sticking in the word time can be a little bit misleading. So see if everyone, you're going to be a tough audience member, I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, if he just counts this one, two, three, four, it's easier and it doesn't suggest a mysterious extra dimension. Oli Roma, Oli Roma, let's get his name wrong. This guy worked out the speed of light for the first time with reasonable accuracy. And what he did was he looked at Jupiter, Galileo had created the telescope, he was looking at Jupiter and its moons, which is quite a phenomenal thing, would, their pictures wouldn't have been as clear as this. Now moons obviously orbit a planet at a very regular rate, we can compare that on Earth, we can just look at the moon orbiting on Earth, we can see that there's no reason for it to speed up or to slow down, so we can assume that these moons orbit Jupiter at a very regular rate. However, they found that one particular moon, well all of the moons, but they, they concentrate on Io, and they found that Io seemed to pop out from behind Jupiter quicker than expected or later than expected. And they couldn't understand why. And eventually they realized it seemed to pop out sooner than expected when Jupiter was nearer to the Earth and later than expected when Jupiter was further away from the Earth. And so Roman determined the speed of light. He realized that light has to have a finite speed. It doesn't travel instantaneously. Everyone thought that light traveled instantaneously because it is incredibly fast, 186,000 miles a second. The first attempts they had to calculate the speed of light involved two blokes on different mountains with lanterns. <laughs> one of them would open his lantern, and then the other one would open his, as soon as he saw it, and the other one would close his, and they'd time it and go, oh, it's a second. <laughs> and really, they'd, they'd have to have done it in a billionth of a second or whatever, a few millionths of a second to get that. Rome estimated that light would take about 22 minutes to travel a distance equal to the to the Earth's orbit. He's saying 200 million miles, basically. He worked out that that's, that's the speed of light. 
that was based on a few other inaccuracies uh, in their, their calculations about how far things were away. But here it says that light has a finite speed, and here it says light travels at um, 200 million miles in 22 minutes. And that's a problem for me because that says time. What I've tried to point out here, and I will get to it later, is that what he really noticed was that as light travels, the Earth spins. And you can compare one thing to the other. We'll cover that in more detail in a second. Isaac Newton, this is all the, the kind of probes of, of, uh, of knowledge and understanding. Isaac Newton was the guy who really understood gravity. He didn't understand what it was, but he did a lot of calculations and he understood how it performs. And all his calculations would involve time. He would work out how many seconds it takes for an object to fall off a tower and things like that. His view was time is something that passes uniformly without regard to whatever happens in the world. For this reason, he spoke of absolute space and absolute time. So what this means is he thought time was a thing that just constantly marched on in its own direction, at its own rate, irrespective of anything else in the world. Absolute time. Einstein changed all of that very radically. He said that space and time are one thing, walkable space and time. Cut a long story short, what he was saying there was that if you get an object with a clock on it, and you move that object very fast, let's say maybe half the speed of light, that clock will <coughs> actually run slow. Not only will that clock run slow, everything with that clock will happen more slowly. If you were with that clock, you would literally change more slowly. There's a thing called the twins paradox, which says if you have one twin on Earth, one twin in an object that's traveling at great speed, you can send that twin away, bring them back, and they would literally be different ages. One twin might be uh, 10 years old, the one who traveled and come back. The other twin might have aged 50 years. And that would be an actual fact. And this is a kind of confirmed thing. These are GPS satellites, or they're meant to be <coughs> GPS satellites. Whenever you have a GPS system in your car, it uses this principle of Einstein. We, we don't have to fully understand it here, but what he calculated back in 1905, 1915, he calculated it, and then they found out that it was true. And that's usually a very good way of checking that you work something out correctly. If you sit down with a piece of paper and you work something out, and then someone tests it, it's a good sign you're on the right track. These satellites have to have clocks that run at a different rate. They have to put in calculations to affect the fact that these clocks run at a different rate to ones on Earth. They have to take out a few millionths of a second a day. If they didn't do that, when you turned on your GPS, it would show you zipping off in a certain direction at 10 miles an hour. When they first sent these satellites up in 1970, whatever, they actually had the code for Einstein's stuff in there disabled with an option to switch it on. And after a while, they realized, oh, we have to switch it on. He was right. Quite phenomenal. Stephen <laughs> Hawking stretches this idea even further. Um, but Einstein said this thing as well, but he said that you could you could create a wormhole. We've all heard about these things. Space and time are linked, so you could perhaps get a massive object. What we're doing here is we're, we're extending this thing. I should explain. If this was the Earth, I've just messed up a couple of pictures here. Any great mass, if this was the sun, any great mass is said to warp space and time. Again, we don't need to fully understand that right now. And this is what causes the Earth to go around the sun. It's not exactly a force of gravity pulling the Earth towards the sun. It's the fact that, that space is warped. Uh, a good demonstration of this, it's only a, uh, a kind of way of visualizing, it's not really how it works, is if you get a trampoline and you put like a bowling ball in the middle of the trampoline, you'll get an impression in the trampoline. And if you roll a tennis ball around it, it will orbit the bowling ball. And that's a very good way of visualizing the essence of what Einstein was saying here. If this mass was heavier and denser and smaller, then this, this, this visualization of how space is warped would become more and more intense. And if you extend it more and more, you could imagine that you might have a mass in one part of space and a mass in the other, and they might create some kind of a tunnel. It's all kind of highbrow stuff. But I'm just pointing out that this is what uh, Stephen Hawking considered it may be possible, and there are a lot of calculations that, that suggest it. That's, that's called wormhole look at. Wikipedia, if you look up the mysteries of time, you get 53 million results. And if you look at time and travel, you get a quarter of a billion results. So people clearly think that time is a mysterious thing, and they clearly think that perhaps you could travel through it, including Hawking, who's a very bright guy. <coughs> this uh, third of people believe time travel is real and not confined to TV shows. There's a poll for Birmingham Science City. Um, 
and that's from the sun, so that's obviously correct. If you look up time travel films, very popular, following 200 pages uh, all about time travel films, so people are interested in whatever. Time travel is the idea of traveling backwards in time to some moment before the present or going forwards from the present into the future. <clears throat> One way time travel into the future is arguably possible. It's currently unknown whether we could travel backwards in time. So what I'm saying is that the bots really do think that time exists and that time travel is a possibility. Now, you can't have the possibility of time travel unless time is a real, real thing. Uh, this is a, a video uh, where Stephen Hawkins explains a certain paradox. Um, and the reason I'm showing this video is to point out that, that at the beginning I said half my friends think it's obvious time doesn't exist and the other half think it's obvious time does exist. Well, the consensus amongst the bods is that time does exist. And I'm trying to get against that. I'm trying to make that clear to you. Because when I have these arguments with my friends in the pub, after about pint number four, they go, yeah, but that's what I said in the beginning. And they totally deny what they said in the beginning. That just drives me mad. You might have heard of the grandfather paradox. What would happen if you went back in time and you killed your own grandfather? How could you be born? Well, what Hawkins done is very brilliantly condensed that into something you can handle in your mind a bit better. So, let's have a look at the film. So, that is an example of what Stephen Hawking is calling a paradox. I point that out because when I have chats with people about time, they go, yeah, but you know, everyone knows it's not real, don't they? Well, you can't have this, this idea <coughs> that someone can see into the past and shoot themselves into the past, or that this guy could turn around and look into the future and try to shoot himself before he shoots himself, all this kind of stuff. So Hawkins thinks that's very real, and that's the kind of thing that I'm going to try and completely untangle for you, completely explain timelessly. There is an interesting part in that video, if you watched it, where at one point we had one scientist and then suddenly we had two. And what always bugs me is that they didn't put the camera a bit higher so we could see just when that happened. Because <laughs> I think it couldn't happen. <coughs> so, the experts think time is real. There is in some sense a past and a future. Hawkins talking about them both here at once existing now. Time is a flow and a direction and there are intervals or durations of time between events. And time is part of space-time, it can be warped or dilated, that just means it can become stretched or slowed down. And time may even theoretically be travelled through forwards or backwards. But what do we think here? Any questions? Any questions so far on what you've seen? Lucy, you must be filled with them. When does it end? <laughs> How do I get out of here? D, are you going back five crouch end? Those kind of things. You haven't said anything we don't know yet. <laughs> well, that's okay, that's good. I had no idea you were so up on theoretical physics. That is interesting tremendously. <laughs> <laughs> so, did, so, did Hawkins make the film about the two scientists? Did he come to any conclusion or did he suppose that as a parallel? Uh, yeah, about the one scientist slash two scientists. Um, he's, he's kind of saying that time exists and that these. What happens is if you have a very massive object, Einstein said that time will slow down near mm. a massive object. So if you have a black yeah, hole, an immensely dense object, you, in theory, could let one guy go near this object and he would be slowed down mm. and someone further away would still be operating at normal speed. And, and he's talking about mixing all these things up together. I'm not entirely sure what he said at the end, but... Do you think that the, the one guy, was, <coughs> the second guy was killed, or the first guy killed him? Uh, he, he said it's a paradox, it's the kind of thing so that gives us modest nightmares. I'm saying that. I don't have any nightmares about things like this, so I think I've worked out what he's talking about and how it will work out with everything just being here now. Mm. Um, cut a long story short, what I'm saying is that you might be able to stretch this guy round, and in a sense, it, maybe what I'm saying. Pull it Sorry. Well, I can show you, I've got a slide further on that we can see it, but what I'm really saying is that a supermassive object might stretch space and it might change the rate at which things happen. But in theory, you could, if you had a supermassive object, you could put one on a city block and you could put your foot forwards and it would go around the block and keep yourself in the backside. Mm. But that would all just be happening. It wouldn't happen over the past or over the future. You see what I'm saying? So I'm saying here, he would never split in two. He might stretch into an incredibly odd shape and shoot himself, but it would be no oh, more odd than you get a gun and shoot yourself like this. Mm -hmm. But it would be... So the setup is, is impossible. Yeah, it's, with these kind of things, what they're doing is exaggerating uh, the scientific principles very greatly so we can see them very neatly. Yeah. Um, you can walk space and the rate at which things happen, but you can only walk it very, very gently.
Yeah, yeah, the yeah, the 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 walks round round the wormhole. Yeah. And then he looks back, he's looking a minute back. Yeah. And then he fires the bullet <coughs> and the bullet's condensed in time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm just working out how it how it meets the one minute in the past. I can see the sure. one minute in the past. I'll show you, I've got a crate a couple of diagrams out there. Does the wormhole affect the passing of the bullet? Well this is what I'm saying. Now this is a good point because we'll I'll explain the pitfalls that we come to when we try to understand time. So, Lucy, if you're saying that you know, I haven't shown you anything you don't know yet, then that means you're convinced that, that this is basically correct and that time obviously exists. And this is my point. What I'm trying to do is, first of all, show you how it obviously exists, and then I'll completely change your mind. That's the point. So in, you've actually fallen into my trap. I just realised that. So what I'm saying, Mark, is, yeah, we could debate this endlessly because I think there's a mistake in it. It's like having a piece in the jigsaw puzzle in the wrong place. You know, but this bit must go here, but that can't. And you go on forever unless you put that first piece correct. And I'll show you what I think the first piece is. Matthew. Shortly. Matthew. Cosmologists. Says cosmologists have nightmares over these things. Yes. Are they astrophysicists? Who, who is, who's a cosmologist? Uh, Carl, Carl Sagan? Say again? Carl Sagan, wasn't he? Yeah. The, uh, the, uh, yes. I don't know. Uh, cosmologist as a physicist. I mean, people who who look at. I think Carl Sagan was the first cosmologist. People who look at the entire universe as one thing and try to understand it. I guess an astrophysicist is someone who works out how stars work. Yeah. I don't know, the whole thing, all at once. On a Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, oh, I miss it. to put Lucy in there. Now, Lucy, <laughs> that'll show you why we think time exists, can tangle ourselves up in this quandary that's confused the greatest minds in the world. Need a, need a, need a, need a post it there. Yeah, I can do that. Yes. <laughs> I'm now going to show you how time does not exist at all. Lucy. 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 <laughs> and there are a number of traps to watch out for. And this is one of the first things. If you just rush in to try and untangle time, you won't do it, in my opinion. Now, over the, the period that I've been trying to work this thing out, I've seen, I've had a lot of conversations. I've seen a lot of the, the ways that we think. Uh, it's a bit like when you ask people a, an awkward question and they sometimes respond to the question but they don't answer it. And you see these little traps and tricks where people get out of facing the, the reality of the thing. So here's some traps to look at. The language of time works. You know, we've been talking now for whatever, 40 minutes, we'll talk for another quarter of an hour or so and then we'll have a break. That language works but there's a reason why that doesn't do time. We can have unseen biases. There's a thing I call the Gareth syndrome. There's a crash test and the problems of having a closed mind or uh, <laughs> making <laughs> false assumptions and not checking them carefully. All right? Don't worry, this is all untangled here. <coughs> the language of time works, but the language of money works as well. Investment, interest rates, economic disaster, um, savings, you know, risk, loans, debts, borrowing, lending. But money doesn't really exist. Money's just a great idea. It's just a load of numbers on a piece of paper. If you, if you build a money detecting machine, you won't find it. We're not going to run out of money because there was a certain amount of money in the world when the Neanderthals were walking around and we've been digging up and discovering it. Yeah, if anything, we get more and more of it. And you might all know that you're basically born about 60,000 pounds in rent, <coughs> which is amazing because I think, well, we made money up. What's going on? How can I be in? Can't we just apologize to the Chinese? I don't know what it's all about. <laughs> so just because the language works, that's not enough proof that the thing really exists. Because what you will observe is that it is constantly now, and we're just using a, a useful load of words. Money doesn't really exist. Where I got these pictures from was from this article. Drug buyer beaten up by a dealer after paying for crack with monopoly money. So <laughs> I'd like to have been there when that happened. I don't know how far he got before I opened the bag and found it. <laughs> but so they traced him down to a small greenhouse that he was living in. Just <laughs> 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 just that That's it. <laughs> Language of the Hobbit works, you know, language of Harry Potter works, but that doesn't prove that all the things they talk about are real. So anyway, unseen bias and errors. This is a little story that I came up with to explain this, this problem. We can contaminate what we are exploring. Imagine you had a couple of explorers going to visit an island, and along the route, one of them says to the other, I wonder if they have any drongos on the island. And the other one says, what do you mean? They say, well, you know, two-headed, three-legged, four-winged drongos. And the other one says, well, do they exist? And the other one says, well, I don't know. My mum used to talk to me about them when I was going to sleep. I've never seen one. They're obviously very rare, probably very valuable. Who knows? I've got an open mind. I'm not biased. We'll find out. So they land on the island, and one of them gets off and says to the native, do you have any drongos here? You know, three-legged, 
two-headed, four-winged drongos, and that's why I've never seen one. And they say, well, can you prove there aren't any here? So, well, no, I can't prove there aren't any. All right, thanks. The other one goes on the island the next day and meets a completely different islander and says, do you have any drongos here? And the guy says, well, mate of mine was talking to me about those just yesterday. So apparently they're very rare and valuable. We're going to hunt for some tomorrow. You're welcome to join us. He goes, join us. I've been waiting for this day all my life. And he goes back and says there's a hunting party for drongos. This guy's heard of them. She goes, that's amazing. The bloke I met hadn't, but let's go and find them. So they end up going on this completely pointless, futile search for a thing that doesn't exist, that they brought the idea of to the island. I can give you an example of contaminating the thing you're examining. Um, First of all, has anyone ever seen a picture of this thing? Okay, all those people who are shaking your heads, consider very carefully how you would know that you hadn't seen a picture of this thing unless I just showed you one. So you clearly have seen a picture of this thing. Yeah, right. This is a uh, Venura um, 13, what we're talking about is Venura 14, Venera, Ven, whatever, sounds like a disease. It's a Russian probe that went all the way to Venus <coughs> to find out what the surface of Venus was made of. So it landed, did all its checks, whatever, put down a probe, and the probe returned the information that the surface of Venus was made of plastic. Uh, the exact same plastic as the lens cap on the camera that this thing had. And it went down, landed, and injected the lens cap, and then it stuck its probe in it when it's plastic. <laughs> Terry, I'm going to take a text that at home, do you know what I mean? So that's a, a, a literal case you can contaminate the thing you're <coughs> examining. What our explorers could have asked, they could have turned up to the island and just asked what is on the island that they wouldn't, they wouldn't have risked contaminating. The problem with the search party is that they won't find any negative evidence. They won't find any evidence that proves that these things aren't on the island. Worse than that, any evidence they find that isn't attributed to something else, they might put in a pile of possible Drongo evidence. So this can get worse and worse and worse. You know, it's all superstition and whatever beliefs. The Garrett syndrome. Anyone watch The Office when they had the fox chicken grain puzzle? Mm. Did you see that one? And they basically, it's a, they're all in a, a course where they're, they're trying to learn team leadership and group work and whatever, and this guy's running the course, and he gives them the problem. You've got a farm with some grain and fox and chicken and a boat, and you can only have one of the things in the boat with him, and he's got to get across the river. But you can't leave the chicken with the fox, because the fox will eat the chicken. You can't leave the chicken with the grain, because the chicken will eat the grain, and so on and so on and so on, and it's a very tricky little problem. So. They ask them to sort it out, Gareth and Tim end up over the Gareth, he gets his wife to help. Tim, he doesn't have a wife. Gareth, all farmers have wives. Tim, this one doesn't, he's gay. Well then, he shouldn't be allowed the animal, should he? <laughs> <laughs> and the point is that, I'll try and give you some examples here, and if you want to grab an odd tangent and run with it, you can, but that's again the kind of thing that stops us getting to the end of this, this problem. It's only insane, maniacal, obsessive, concentration on the subject that will get you through there. But I've done all that for you. So all you have to do is just watch. The crash test. Hello. How are you? Hi. Hi. Yeah. But you're late. But time doesn't exist. So it's yeah, it's there. true. You were just too far away to hear it all. So do come in, join the next right. stuff. Um, we've all just stood up and told everyone a few things about ourselves. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> you're just telling me stuff you know already. And so, of course, Jesus <laughs> loves us all. And <laughs> what is your name, by the way? Rachel. Rachel, come in. Yeah, we missed basically kind of the first half, but don't worry. That's Lucy will explain that it was all blatantly obvious anyway. <laughs> what I've done in the first half is I've explained how it's obvious that time does exist. And now I'm going to explain in the second half or whatever how time doesn't exist. Okay? All right, don't worry. Relax, take a breath, we catch up. <clears throat> what I'm doing now is I'm talking to people about the kind of mental, I should say, problems. <laughs> Every time I look at you, I don't know why. The mental blocks we can have to, to seeing uh, a certain situation clearly. And this is uh, what I call the car crash syndrome. <clears throat> Imagine you were teaching someone to drive a car and you said to them, look, here's the thing, you've got to look out the front of the car. If you see anything in the way, you've got to slow down and stop, put the brakes on. And the person you're teaching goes, great, and they drive off and they crash straight to a lamppost. And you say, then what happened? You go, I don't know, I wasn't looking. I was checking my text. You go, well, you can't do that. You've got to look out the front of the car. If you see anything, you've got to stop. And you go, great, I've got it. Look out the front, blah, blah, blah. Drive off, hit the house. You go, what happened? You go, I don't know. I was looking at the map. You go, no, you've got to look out the front. You go, oh, I've got it. You've got to look out the front and put the brakes on. Yeah, got it. Drive off, drive into here. What's happening? You go, I don't know. I wasn't looking. 
And the point is this, you can give someone advice and that person could literally go off to one of their friends and say, Matt taught me how to drive and I listened to everything he said and I crashed three times in a row. And they go, wow, you must be a really bad teacher. But that's not the whole truth. The whole truth is that they listened but they then didn't apply the rule. That saying, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth is very important because it, it covers all angles. The truth, you can get, well, you can lie just by saying the truth if you just select which bits of it. The whole truth means you have to tell everything, but you can also lie again if you embellish it. Tell the whole truth and the cover extra bits. So you have to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Go with things very clear. <coughs> so we can hear and understand something, but if we don't apply it, it cannot work. Again, I've missed out Lucy there. <laughs> I'm going to leave it in a minute. Oh, no, I'm just, and there we there are time. So, with timelessness, there is a critical question that we have to ask, and that question is: What if things could just exist and move and change? We say that things exist and move and change over time, whatever that's meant to mean. But I'm asking: What if things could just exist and move and change? Would that explain everything that we see and we attribute to time? That's the critical question. We'll move on if we go into that in more detail. detail. Close minds and unchecked assumptions. Normally two mountains will tie themselves together and work together as a team to get up a mountain, but if you use that rope the wrong way and you just try not to get up the mountain, you will probably succeed. So you have to kind of, it's very important not to let rubbish in your brain. You've got to question everything that I say, but if you're just insistent on not getting something, it's like looking at one of those magic eye pictures and trying not to see it, you will succeed. Did not see it. Unchecked assumptions. If you go to a show like Darren's Brown with the assumption that mind reading is possible, then you'll come away thinking that your assumption has been confirmed. It, everything you see will just confirm, and you will come away going, oh, I want my money back. It was obvious. It was all mind reading, wasn't it? You know? <clears throat> and if you have an unchecked assumption, you might even come away not bothering to check it. And this is important to time, because if you assume that time exists, it will seem as if it does exist. The system of time works brilliantly, I'm not denying it, but this is why it's a perfect illusion, a persistent illusion, as Einstein put it, because it works brilliantly and you won't see through it unless you take a step back and be wary of the mistakes you might make in looking at it. Einstein said the distinction between the past, present and the future is only illusion, however persistent, but to be precise, there really can't be any illusions. You must always see what you're seeing. You might misunderstand what you're seeing, but you will be seeing what you're seeing. So you see it exactly what you see. You might misunderstand it. You might assume it means something different to what it is. But this is a good example of a persistent illusion. It's a bit freaky if you think about it too much, but this is the view out of a car windscreen. How many people here would think that they can see out through a window? If you're driving along, you can see the cars in front of you, you can look out the window, you can look out the back. Anyone here thinks they can't see out through a window? I've learned to ask the questions the other way around. <laughs> well, if you think you can see out through a window, you're completely wrong. You can see the light coming in through a window, but you can't see out through a window. And it doesn't seem to matter at all. It seems obvious and unimportant. But for you to see this tree, the light has to hit the tree, then it goes in through the window, then it goes in through your eyeball and it's focused onto your retina. That's what you actually see and that picture is upside down. We all know that from school. But we kind of immediately forget it. It's a very disturbing thing when you fully understand that, that in this room, we all feel that we can see this room, but we can't. All we can see is the back of our eyes. In reality, this room is, is in a sense, completely black with just these kind of pairs of things that are being seen. It's very unnerving if you think about it too much. You might think it's the same thing. It's the same as looking out through the window. Well, if you went into a town and you asked the guy where there was the nearest petrol station, he said, yeah, it's about 10 miles that way, and he went down that way, and he ran out of petrol, and he walked back into town, and he said, where is the nearest petrol station? He said, oh, it's 10 miles that way. I've got it completely back to front. But that's the same as getting it right, isn't it? It's not. It doesn't really matter in this case, and this is a persistent illusion. You will, you will look at your friend, and you'll think you see him over there, but you don't. You see him here. If you think that and that are the same thing, you get a magnifying glass, you get a candle, this candle will make an image on the wall. If you put your finger here, it will get burned. If you put your finger here, it won't get burned. They're not the same thing. Anyone remember this scene from uh, <laughs> Father Ted? Uh, if you don't know, it's Father Ted. He's explaining to Dougal, is it Dougal? So, I'll go over once again, Dougal. He says, these cows are very small. He points out the window. Those cows, cows are a long way away. 
And that <laughs> kind of irritates me because neither of them understand that what they're really comparing is the size of the images on their eyeballs, which are both the same. This explains why when you look up at the sky and you see an airliner, it seems to be very small and it seems to be traveling very slowly. That's obvious. We're completely used to that. But the reality is that what you're actually seeing is something that is very small and that is traveling very slowly. What you're really seeing is a little image in the back of your eye. And it's very small and it's traveling very slowly. If that plane takes a minute to go from horizon to horizon, that little image of the plane will take a minute to go across your eye. That image is traveling at about two centimeters a minute. It doesn't matter. We, we can live our entire lives not thinking about these things in this detail. But this is an example of a persistent illusion. A persistent illusion will work automatically because nature just enables it to work. It's not because someone's trying to trick you into something. And I'll try and show you that time is uh, uh, that kind of thing. So we're going to apply these lessons to time now. We could take a break if anyone wants a break. We can do this in two or three sections. <coughs> or should we continue on? We shall continue on then. This is, all of that is a preamble because it's important to get that or you won't penetrate the illusion. If I'm right, I may well be wrong. I've been wrong once before. Oh, no, I haven't. Oh, damn, I just was. Well, Virtually all the books that I've read on time start by either assuming that time obviously exists, or by asking does time exist, or by asking what is time. And hopefully those little lessons I've shown you before can show you there's a problem there. If time doesn't exist and you ask what is time, you'll be in a little trap. You'll be trying to work out the nature of something that doesn't exist. If you ask does time exist, you're polluting the very thing you're looking at. If you assume time exists, well, again, you've made that, that early mistake. Perhaps like the people who visited the island, it would be better to first ask, when we look at the world around us, what do we basically see? Oh, Enough, Dee? Good. <laughs> Sorry. Right. If you wait, right. there'll be three or four passengers. No, I'm just very tired. Really it's going in. Yeah, I know. I, know. I, I get that a lot. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> These people are just too polite to mention it. <laughs> 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 so this is what I'm saying. If you want to understand the world around you, if you look at those early people who were talking about time, what is time? It's got this, it's got that. I'm saying let's take a step back. Let's look at the world around us and ask what do we basically see? Now in my opinion, <coughs> you basically see that things exist, these objects here, that they can move and that they can interact. And this is of course mousetrap. Best example of interaction I could find on the internet. And that's what we start off by seeing. So we could at least agree that things exist and they move and they interact. Then one disagree with that. We could get heavily metaphysical, but that would be getting a bit, whatever, pointless. This leads to the key, key or critical question. If objects in the world could just exist, move and interact as we directly observe them, would this explain everything that we attribute to time? If things can just exist and move and interact, would that be enough to mislead us into thinking there was an extra thing going on, like time? So I mean, a Galileo might have counted his pendulums and then thought he was looking at some mysterious other dimension. We can ask these people this question. These are the people who came up before. Augustine, Galileo, Newton, Einstein, Hawking. We can apply this question. <clears throat> if matter could just exist and move, would that explain everything that you think is to do with time? A more important question to us than would be, have you asked that question yourself? Because if any of these people have gone and done, the, done their studies without first checking that perhaps all they see is enough to explain time, they might have run off on a wild goose chase, whatever. So I'm saying there's no such thing as time, there's just movement and change. How did that get in there? And this is not an issue of semantics. So at least when you're saying that, yeah, that's obvious the time thing exists, and this is what I'm trying to point out here, because a lot of people say, oh, yeah, but you just play with words, you know, it's obvious. And I'm trying to make it clear that this is the column I'm supporting, and this is the column that time supports. And don't worry, this is the, these two slides are the most writing the whole thing, and there aren't any more with this much writing. I'm just saying things move and change, they can interact, and they exist. That's almost all I'm saying, pretty much. If you believe in time, you think they move and change over time, they interact over time, Time exists, it passes, it's got a flow, it's got intervals, there's an order to events, causes create effects in the future, the past exists, the future exists. <coughs> I'm saying the present exists just as we observe it. So this is, people say to me, what's your experiment, what's your proof that proves what you're saying is correct? And I go, well this, just this, this is all I'm claiming exists, is what is here now. 
I'm not making any extra claims. Really, the people who claim in time exists should have this great big proof. They're the ones that are claiming something invisible exists. So, I'm saying exists. They say the present exists between the past and the future. Space and time, you mix up together. Don't worry about that, we'll talk about it later. Um, Travelling at speed slows down, the passage of time, clocks run slow. This is an observed fact, but I'm saying it's not to do with time exactly. One way time travel is possible. Um, gravity slows down time, travel travel into the past, maybe possible. So if you can just see that those, all of these things are not in this column, so this is not a discussion about semantics, so I haven't confused my words. I'm saying that I've got a completely different view, and maybe it's wrong. Yeah, I'm putting my hands up, it could be wrong, but it's not an issue of me just mixing up my words. So we apply this key question to the past, the present, and the future. First of all, the past. Has anyone got a pen on them? Because it's a little experiment that we can do. Just need a simple, straightforward pen. I'm going to show you how we can change someone's mind. First of all, we look at this random symbol. You can do it. If anyone's got a piece of paper, you can do it yourself. It's not a big thing. Do you want to try that there? So I need anyone to look at the symbol. I don't know if you can do this. Uh, don't know anything yet. Have you the symbol? Have you looked at it? It's not a symbol. Now see if you can draw it while you can't see it. Mm -hmm. You can do this just by imagining it. It's just another yeah. thought experiment. You can do it. I guarantee you that I will at least change your mind in one way tonight. Okay. <coughs> So, are right, you done that? Yep. Mm -hmm. Right, now can you compare what you've drawn to this symbol? Does it look similar? Um, similar. Okay, and you drew that symbol while this one was covered up? Yes. So what that means is that I've changed your mind. The only way you could have drawn that symbol is if you had a version of it in your head, in some form or another, when I covered it up. That makes sense? I mean, it's very mm -hmm. obvious, it's not, it's not a tricky thing. So, <coughs> a simple experiment proves that when you look at something, it changes your mind. But we didn't add anything to you. We didn't give you more food, we didn't give you more energy, we didn't take anything away from you. Didn't give me a drink. We didn't give you a drink, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but you could re recreate that symbol. So what that shows is that for you to be able to recreate that symbol, things have to be able to exist and move and change. Light has to hit the symbol, symbol has to go into your retina, retina has to go into your brain, you need light, eyes, optic nerves, brain, brain chemicals, and all those things only need to do is they need to exist and they need to move and they need to be able to change. We might add the words over time, but I'm not quite sure what you mean by that at that point. Next question, the symbol on a piece of paper. Tony, if you, got, if you look at that symbol on your piece of paper there, have you got any idea how that symbol got there? It's kind of an obvious question, but it's a trick question as well. Me, pen, and paper. Exactly. And you did that a minute or two in the past. <laughs> if there is a past. If there is a past. But yeah. the question is, how would you know? How would you know you did that a minute or two in the past? Did you go back in the past, or did you just look at the contents of your head? Yeah. Yeah. It's inside my head. Exactly. So what I'm saying is we think that we're talking about the past, but really we're talking about the contents of our head. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> perhaps that proves that there is a past, but that's the question. If you had an ink roller and you run it down a piece of paper, it would be fairly obvious to any detective that this roller probably made these blobs of ink. You could even film the event. But whatever you did, you would always store the evidence on a physical thing that exists now, be it in your brain, on a bit of video, on a bit of film tape. So all of our evidence that the past exists is here now. We seem to have deduced that the past exists, has really happened. So the million pound question is this. If I had a million quid, is there anyone here who would take on the bet that they, they have to go out and find me some evidence that World War II happened. So if you can get me some reasonable evidence, you know, I won't be picky, that World War II happened, I would give you a million pounds. Anything that reasonable people accept. So is there anyone here who wouldn't take on that bet? Good, so you would all take on that bet. That means that you're all convinced that there's enough evidence just here now to thoroughly convince us that the past exists or happened. And make no mistake, things happen and they are happening, and in a sense they have happened. But my question is, is there any other record of it that's created anywhere else than on bits of paper or in our brains? Because if there isn't a record created anywhere else, then that thing doesn't really exist. And things could perhaps just move and change here now. And it's quite odd when you get that idea, because it's a bit like watching one of those magic eye pictures, and you kind of go, 
but no, yeah, but it's obvious it's here now. And then you kind of go, yeah, but it was obvious the timing system, but just listen to all those gods who said it was obvious. So that's the thing that I'm trying to get you to step into. And you step in and out of it, yeah, again, maybe I'm wrong, whatever. So Matthew, stop you there. Go back to previous slide. Mm -hmm. Lucy, you're a financial expert. Do you think there's a million pounds in? <laughs> <laughs> we did work it out, didn't we? One, two, three, four. It's interesting when you want to talk about a million. If you look at these um, these zeros, whatever. If you've got a thousand sugar cubes in a row, and then behind each one of those you put a thousand, you'd have a million sugar cubes. Likewise, if you've got a hundred sugar cubes in a row, and you put a hundred behind, and then you made it a hundred high, you'd have a million sugar cubes. It's a good way of visualising it. A hundred times a hundred times a hundred is a million. I sat in a pub one day and drew lots of diagrams. So, we think that the external physical evidence and our internal mental evidence leads to the proof that the temporal, the time-based past, really exists. We put those two things together and we think we correctly introduced that it makes sense to talk about the past. Hawking in that video is talking about firing a bullet back into the past. And in that video he's kind of saying, well, the guy <coughs> is just doing what he's doing, so maybe the past is rigid but it's all happening. I don't know, it's kind of a confusing thing to think about. But this is my point. We think this evidence and this evidence, and this is very intimate personal evidence that you know can't really be tampered with, proves that the past exists. And I'm saying maybe it doesn't. Maybe it just proves that things exist and they move and they change now. And that's it. Imagine there was a crime you know, or, a, or a car crash or an accident and uh, you've witnessed it and you take a few pictures and you pick up a bit of evidence and you remember <coughs> what happened and the police phone you up a few weeks later and they say, you know, did you see what happened? And you go, well, there's evidence, you know, there's skid marks and the thing, there's footprints here, there's an oil leak, there's a dent, the tree's gouged, I've got photographs, I've got a glove here. And he says, yeah, but, but what do you remember? And you say, well, last week I remember at six o'clock I heard a screech, then I looked out the window, I saw a guy running away, then I heard a bang, all this different stuff. But when you show him the photographs, you'll be showing him something that's here now. When you show him the glove, you'll be showing him something that's here now. But when you talk about your memories, you'll talk about them in a different way. You'll say, oh yeah, that was in the past. But really, you're just showing him the thing that's in your head here now. So again, this only really proves that things are here now. It's a hard concept to grasp, whatever. And I'm labelling this thing about the past because the past is like our very first cornerstone for assuming that time exists. We assume the past exists in some way, some, some vague way, and it's, it's not even really fair about how vague we are about the past. People change their minds in conversation. If I say to you, I went to a party last week with, uh, with Peter and Fred, and you go, oh really, so three of you went? You go, no, no, just me. And you go, well, you said Peter and Fred went. Oh yeah, they did come. So they were three of you. No, they don't exist. What, don't they exist? No, they do exist. They came to be the pie. You'd have to at some point say, look, do this Peter and Fred exist or not? And when we talk about the past and the future, you've got to go, look, do these things exist or not? It's just not scientific to be airy-fairy about them and pretend that they do in one conversation and don't in another. So that's why I showed you the Hawking video, because he's saying, look, it really does exist. And Einstein says we really can walk time and so on and so on. You can point to and talk about a map as if it really were the territory it represents. That makes sense. You can say, we're here, we've got to get here, and this is 200 miles. But of course it isn't. We're not really here, and we're not getting there, because it's a piece of paper that isn't 200 miles, it's four inches. But it'd be pointless to be so pedantic, unless you're really trying to be truthful about something. But for this conversation to be legitimate, we must be able to prove that the actual territory exists. Otherwise, you can end up buying a swap or nothing at all, whatever. So a map is great, it's great to talk about that way, but the territory has to exist. With time, we point to and we talk about fossils, books, paintings, photos, videos, memories, and so on, ad infinitum, I don't know if I'm using that word properly or not, as if they are maps pointing to the territory, the temporal past, the time-based past, the past that they're said to represent. But we never actually see the territory. We seem to have thousands of bits of evidence. Yeah, we can find dinosaur fossils. Yeah, we can find ancient starlight. We can find all these things, but we never actually see the thing that they're meant to be pointing at. Without exception, all of this stuff is just literally here now. While seen as maps representing the proof of the past, they only actually prove that matter can exist and change and interact now. One way to look at that is to ask yourself this question: If time exists, if things exist and they move and they change over time, 
Would that explain everything? Where you go, yeah, if time exists and things move and change over time, that would explain fossils, old books, famous paintings. This is the Battle of Waterloo, I think. Brunel, <coughs> videotapes, our memories. If time exists and things move and change over time, that would explain all of this evidence. But there's another question to ask, which is, if time doesn't exist, if things could just exist and move and change, would that explain everything we observe? And I think the answer is yes. It would explain how some things be can become very stable and other things can become very unstable. And some things are, uh, we fall apart before this falls apart. You know, you can look at a raindrop in the puddle and that disintegrates before we disintegrate. Just things happening at different rates. <coughs> if we assume time exists, it seems to answer our question, so then we don't ask that second question. And that's my point. The question is, is there a third temporal record, the past, or is there not a temporal record? This is key because the past existing is our main reason for assuming that time exists. So if objects in the world could just exist and move and interact, would this explain all that we attribute to the past? We can discuss this and then have a break, or have a break and then discuss it. Has anyone got any questions? If things move and change, so they surely don't move and change over time. <laughs> Listen to anything I've been saying. <laughs> That's a very good point. And that, the next thing here is the present. Because I'm just worried, because right, right, there's a lot to take in. So if anyone wants a break, you will have to go on for another section. No, have, have a break. break. Okay, have a break. But yeah, the present. This is now officially break time. Yeah. Is that like being at school, but you're not going to turn on? How you doing, Lise? Badly. Yeah, don't worry about it, honestly. It's just relax. It doesn't exist. Why do we have the same memories? Why can we have memories of the same thing that happened two weeks ago? Yeah, because as you, um, you look at something and it happens, it changes your mind. You're, you you're carry physically it. somewhere. We are physically in a place. Yeah. It happened. Yeah. You can't change it. You can't go back to the past and change it. It happens. Uh huh. If you give me any example of something that happened, anything you remember, like, I don't know, having your party or whatever, right. the reality is that you will be talking about the, the contents of your mind. It'd be like looking at a videotape. And that's happened. Whatever words you put on it, it still happened. It yeah, still it, happened. things happen and they happen. Now. Like World War Two happened. I wouldn't deny that because it would be disrespectful to people who died for my own freedom now. So I am saying that things happen, and then it's a very tricky point. But in a sense, they have happened. But there, if there isn't a record of them anywhere else, then there isn't a record of them anywhere else. But it still happened. But yeah but, it, it, yeah, but you're saying it happened without the constrictions of using the word time. It happened, but yeah, it's all yeah, happened. It's, it's, it's not a, there's not a sense of... I'm saying there's no long time or a short time. Yeah. I'm saying yeah. the past is purely and only an idea. As things happen, we might record it on video or something else, but does the universe make another recording of it somewhere? Because if the universe does record it in the past, then the past exists. And if the universe doesn't, then the past doesn't. And everything Hawking and Galileo and Newton and all those people say is a confusion. Because they're... But it's just words. It's like saying time. It's just a way of measuring. If it's just words, we have to ask, what was Hawking talking about? He's talking about a bloke going around to a... This is physics, but it's, it's a theoretical thing. If you look at all these equations, theoretically, you could make some version of this wormhole and shoot a bullet into the past. So the question is, does the past exist, or does it not exist? No, he, he shoots it into a picture of the past. Because the word more is condensed time, isn't it? So if you went through that, that should you should pass instantaneously. Well, I'm saying there's no such thing as time. time. I'm saying it's, it's a condensed yeah, word, space. Word, yeah, but the word more is like the proof of the fact that no, <laughs> there is no time, isn't it? Because basically when you pass through the word more, you go from one place to another place instantaneously. But the question is, where would, how would there be two versions of it? How would one version still be doing this, and the other version yeah, the, the, the question is, how would it get around the word more to look back a minute in time? And this is what I'm saying, is that this is the confusion. We, we should at least be able to agree there's a confusion. If there's no such thing as time, you're saying things just exist, move and interact. Yeah. But also, the previous example, you said some things decay before other things, and yeah. things decay at different at rates. At different rate, How can yeah. you use words like before <coughs> and rate without yeah. acknowledging yeah. time? Before, I mean, it's an interesting word because it could literally be in front of. I could die before you. I could die in front of you. You know, I could put a pint down before you. And if, the problem is, if you, if you, it's unscientific, we go, yep, time exists, let's have a look at the world as if time exists. It will always seem to be correct. The question you have to ask yourself is, what if things could just move and change? So, if things could just move and change, could I have said that sentence? 
trying to remember what it was you said now exactly. Um, but if things can just move and change, could things move and change at different rates? You know, do you see what I'm saying? Whatever that well, philosophy. Well, there a different rate other than time has to be a part of the well, rate? Well, there's a, a slide. I'm going to move on to the next slide. Um, Hey, this was yeah, a little break. break. Okay, well, yeah, we're on a break. Yes, let's hold on. Those questions uh, I do come up in the next section. So, yes, hold that thought. Hold that thought. Have a little break and uh, yeah. go to the bar, but don't drink too much. <laughs> <laughs> what I've really got to do with this is spit it up a bit more. No, I'll tell you what, most of the things very good. Very, that's a good look. <laughs> yeah, right.